Party people, what's really good? Welcome to the new year. This is episode 124. Yours truly, Scott Russell. In this episode, what we get into is some stories of reconnecting with your past. And mainly, we, we dive straight into accepting your authentic self and how the answer to that isn't always the one that we want. Um, we talk about ex uh, accepting radical responsibility for your life, accountability, dependability, and challenging the curriculum of who I think I want to be and how to achieve that. Fun episode. Thank you for listening. Thank you. If you haven't subscribed yet, please smash that subscribe button. It would mean the world to us. If you're just listening on, the po uh, on audio on the podcast, head over to YouTube. We're trying to grow that channel. Uh, smash the subscribe button. That would mean the world. Also, if you want to get involved with the podcast, send us an email at fromthegravepodcast at gmail.com. Fromthegravepodcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear you send in a, a voice memo. Those are always really fun. We'll play it while we're recording, respond to you. If you have any suggestions for certain guests, um, send us some info on them and why you would want them on the show. And, uh, We'll, we'll look at it, and if it makes sense, we'll, we'll rock forward. So um, anyways, guys, I hope you're having a beautiful new year, and let's make it great. Thank you for the support and love. Peace. What's the eternal principle? Rahman. <laughs> Which is? Well, we call it God, but that personifies it. Little bit, not a lot. All right, so 124 Zul. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. It's kind of weird that, you know, you have the, the case set up to where I can't see you, but I like it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to get a snap of that, though. Hold up real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, give me that. Yeah, little peak ski. Yeah, little peak ski. There we go. Um, <clears throat> all right, so... Yeah, we uh, we just went live and kind of we just went live and uh, had people jump on and, and hit us with uh, some topics that you would want talked about. Um, and people were ripping off some good stuff. And you know what? I think we're going to vibe with that because it, it creates like a like an intimate episode where you guys are part of the deal in the moment right there about to record and then I can let you know uh, if I talked about what you brought up or not, or just assume that I did, and then you're gonna have to watch or listen to find out. Um, <clears throat> so, a little recap, a little recap of, well, it's been like a couple weeks. I hope everyone had an incredible holiday and that you're having a really good new year. Um, my New Year's Eve couldn't have been better. It was um, the perfect entrance into 2024. Um, and my, I went home to New York, spent some time with the fam. And uh, that was just, um, oh my gosh, it was so needed. Um, I turn my all my notifications off on my phone specifically my emails from work um and it was just uh you know how like sometimes when you go home on a vacation or you just take a vacation period it seems like it goes really fast or you just get back to work and you feel like you didn't go anywhere this time was the opposite of that it went it was dead slow and it was peaceful I was able to let go of all responsibilities. Um, and I was, you know, I've been refreshed. And it was funny, like, I was like, oh, I'm kind of excited to get back to work, you know, you know, talk to these guys, try and help, whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and then I got back. I was like, fuck this, man. But we bounced back. It was all right. It was a short week. Um, and, yeah, so let's see what happened at home. Um, 
I ended up watching an episode of myself um, with my family, which was odd. Uh, and just as an FYI, I never watch episodes back. I never listen to myself audio. The only time I will do that is if I have a guest on and, uh, you know, they're worried, wondering how they did that, 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 I'll, I'll listen back if, uh, if a guest is on sometimes, but, um, so anyways, just a lot of laughs, a uh, lot of screwing around, uh, Christmas shopping with my sisters and, uh, you know, just, just, just chilling, man, just chilling in, in New York. Um, it was crazy nice out too. It was like 50 degrees. There was no snow. Um, so that was nice. I went and did, uh, I usually hit this, uh, CrossFit gym up when I go home just to get a little workout in, which is CrossFit Smoky Hollow in Baldwinsville. Shout out if you guys are listening. Um, and dude, they had this, like this workout was just like so stupid. It was like all my worst movements and I don't CrossFit like that anymore. You know, I don't do it like that anymore. And it like banged me up. So that was sick. That was super sick. That was a complete falling short. Um, of a chosen ideal, um, but I bounced back. One of the best, uh, well, not one of the best moments, but I was able to, let me talk about this. Let's get into this. So I was able to reconnect with my best friend growing up, Doug, AKA Dougie Fresh. And, you know, you, you know, you meet a lot, you meet people and especially like, my age, right? Uh, 30 and above, you'll meet people and they'll be like, Oh, so and so is my best friend. We've known each other since the sandbox, you know, whatever, just even if they even if they live apart in different states, they have this best friend that they have gone through life with. Uh, specifically people in recovery, because, you know, especially if, if the best friend isn't isn't an addict or an alcoholic you tend to like split roads and separate yourself from uh your friends in that moment but people get better and they come back and they'll be talking about oh i got this best friend right and i'll usually say like you don't understand how lucky you are to have that i literally have zero people in my life from my past from syracuse zero people <clears throat> the only person that i would want to have currently, uh, and you know, in my life would be would be Dougie Fresh, and we just kind of uh, we just kind of lost 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 connect, really, um, you know. And when I when I came to Florida to get my shit together, I Syracuse. I didn't really have a good relationship with that city, with uh, 315. And I left it in the rear view easily. And I think what happened is, you know, my best friend, Dougie Fresh, he, uh, I, I think I just grouped him into that. I just put him into that, you know, Syracuse pot and set it on the shelf and it wasn't intentional he, he's like he's not a bad influence like no, he's the best there's there's zero reason why that could have happened or, or should have happened right um and before i went home i was kind of thinking about you know and there it's fear it, it's me being scared of my past and who I was and the relationships I had with friends and how I presented and the man that I was back in Syracuse was, uh, is, I, I don't even know who that guy was. It was completely different. And so there's a lot of fear and insecurity and, you know, just uh, maybe scared that people still remember me a certain way, you know, and that I can't 
outgrow or outlive maybe a perception of me. And anyway, so I was always, so what came up this time was I need to, uh, I need to tap, I need to tap back in. I, I want to reconnect with my past and not be scared and not just go home and, you know, stay with my family. And when friends reach out to me and they say, how long you home that I make an effort to go be with them and talk to them. Um, so anyways, I, uh, I hit up Doug and, you know, told him I was in town and he's got a, you know, he's got a family. He's got three kids. He married, uh, Alicia, shout out Alicia. Um, they've been together since, since high school. Um, and they're both just great people, you know? Um, now me and Doug, man, we fucking, <laughs> just all this stupid shit, you know what I mean? And, what I respect about Doug is he went just as hard as me, just as hard as me. Um, and we started going hard while we were in, while we were in high school. Right. But Doug was a, always able to show up to school, be on the, in the honor society, you know, straight A's 4.0. Like he was just always like had that gear of, even though he was being an idiot with me and getting fucked up, he was always able to have pillars of value in his life. And even though he was being an idiot in certain areas, he was able to like shut that shit off, stop and give attention to the true value of his life. And <clears throat> He never got into some of the hard shit, thank God, that I got into. So I started to separate myself and I, you know, I, I went bye bye. I went down and uh, he, he went up. He continued on. He went up. You know what I mean? And um, Doug's very practical. You know, he just made a decision to go be in this trade, went and did the trade, been with the company for um, shit like, I don't know, like. Uh, 20, like 10, probably like 15 years, um, had some kids and, uh, you know, he's just killing it, man. But it was funny. Like, so anyways, we went to Stella's diner and we met up and, uh, I was a little nervous, you know, I was a little nervous just because I hadn't seen him in nine years since he got married. Uh, I was at his wedding nine years ago and I was a little, I was like a little nervous for some stupid reason, you know? And, uh, dude, as soon as I see him, it was just bah, back right there, you know, just all love, best friends, just, just back, you know, and that, that is, uh, that's love. That's, that's cool as hell, man. I and mean, we were inseparable. We did everything together. All the dumb shit, <laughs> throwing mud balls at cars when we were younger, uh, shooting cars with paintballs, just dumb shit, you know? And, it, but those are the memories. Those are the memories, you know, when you're just, kids do dumb shit. You know what I mean? Especially, especially boys. We just do dumb shit. Um, and so we sat down, man, and he just caught me up on his life. And, uh, and he was just, I saw joy, you know, I saw a man that was proud of himself, um, and working on himself and was a, proud father I mean he was like there's nothing better he goes watching these kids grow up he was just like he was just smiling ear from ear you know same same Doug man and but to see him like dialed into the simplicity of love like that and to see how much he love and cares for his family and how fucking hard he works to support them um, is inspiring as hell, you know, is very, very inspiring. And he's just a good man, dude. So it was, it was really good connecting with you, homie, man. It's good to, it's good to have you back, dog. Um, yeah. So anyways, I, I, I talked about, I wanted to talk about that just because it was like a good moment, you know, and it was nothing like 
profound, but I got my best friend back, you know, and we've been talking every day ever since. But I guess the consideration is like, you know, what kind of relationship do you have with your hometown? You know, has it been in the past? You put it on a shelf. Is there any type of shame or guilt, you know, like threaded through that uh, in the past? I don't know. For me, there has been. And there's more there's more mending, you know, there, there's a lot more mending to do. Not there's not that there's like, uh, you know, some uh, specific, like huge amends that I have to make da, 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 da. You know, for Dougie, I just wanted to clear shit up because he had like this. Um, <clears throat> he had this uh, like. He kind of thought that he was like a trigger for me and nothing could be further from the truth, you know. <laughs> number one, I was the one that was, you know, the bad influence, um, which is hard for moms to accept, but sorry, mom. And it was just, um, I just wanted to clear shit up. You know, I wanted to, I wanted him to be able to look in my eyes, tell him a little bit of my story, how I'm doing, how I move in the world, um, and let him know that, it had zero to do with him and everything to do with me. Um, and, and just to, to reconnect, you know, to have these, have these people back. And, uh, it was funny. I wanted to take, you know, I was like, Oh, we got to get, I'm thinking like, before I go, then like, we got to get a picture together. And of course, you know, two guys, whatever, we just completely, I completely forgot. And then Alicia, she was like, I'm pissed at you guys for not taking a picture. So <laughs> sorry about that. At least we'll, uh, we'll run it back. But anyways, Doug, man, I love you, man, and it's, I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy we're back, bro, because it's been too fucking long. Um. Anyways, dude. So, oh my God, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this story. This is wild. It, this is like completely left field. But um. All right. So years ago, right when I started started FTG. I think it might have been like 2019. I'm pretty sure the podcast was rolling. The clothing line was was set. And I was, you know, pumping out gear and all that and like stepping into the community in Delray, tempered training, recovery through repetition, all these guys, you know, just in it, right? <clears throat> and there is this uh, woman, this uh, that she's involved with like some, uh, I forget the name, but some, some nonprofit. And she's a very, very, God, Jesus woman, right? And she had reached out to me one time and was like, I didn't really know her that well. We were a little bit back and forth on Instagram, you know, all love, that, 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 all this shit. And uh, she was like, hey, you know, she hit me up. She's like, hey, you know, what I'm thinking is I'd like to do a collab and, uh, you know, make a t-shirt, do this event, blah, 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 blah. And I didn't even, uh, there was just, I didn't want to do it uh, with her. I wasn't really like, we weren't that close, you know, and I would just like, I had done like three different collabs before that with, you know, Red Rum Society, Recovery Through Repetition, like, you know, the homies. And I believe I had said something like, oh, you know, I appreciate the consideration. I'm like, I'm all collabed out for the moment, like maybe in the future. She said to me, she goes, completely flipped the script right from this oh like la 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 i would love to do this collab everything's love and god 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 she goes without missing a beat well you should really reconsider because god told me this was supposed to happen <laughs> the fuck dude you sure it was god because he didn't tell me shit you know what i mean and it's just like <laughs> Yeah, dude, I know. You know, listen, just because people got, uh, you know, a fucking fish, you know, a picture of a fish and a cross and a heart on the on the bumper of their car don't mean their spiritual IQ is tapped in. All right. Like. All I said was nah, like I'm good. And what she gave me was you're wrong. I'm up here with God. I have one-on-one -on -one communication. And how you responded is no longer in line with what I know he said. 
bitch. Get the fuck out of here with that. So other people are allowed to believe as they want to believe. But anytime someone starts to lord their belief above you, that's spiritual pride. And they're separating themselves from how God moves. Now, that's cool. I'm not upset with her or anything. But like when I see things like that, it's just like, oh, holy shit, you know, because it's easy to converse with someone and get in like the love and fluffy. Oh, my God, God and how God works and how God works. But if you want to understand where someone's at with the relationship with God, tell them something they don't like. Tell them something they don't like, you know. Um, I've had people tell me that, uh, you know, I'm not one to think that, you know, I'm a big Christ guy, right? Like, I love how Christ moves, but I also love and appreciate other gods and the things I can learn from them and the similarities between the walk of Christ and them. And... I don't really subscribe to the fiery hell burn in eternity type thing if I don't try to convert other people to Christians. I don't fucking, I, I'm sorry, I don't move around with shame and guilt like that and fear and trepidation. And that's just where I'm at right now. I've had other people call, oh, you're not, you're not Christian. You're not, number one, I don't want to claim any denomination, but I've had other people tell me like, oh, you're wrong, so you don't really have a relationship with God. What, because I don't have conviction in that part of the Bible? Get the fuck out of here. Come on, man. God came to me in the worst moments of my life when I didn't believe, when I cursed the name, when I was living in hell, right? When I was practicing evil, when I... And he still showed up. So what? My beliefs now are going to keep me out of a relationship. Get the fuck out of here, man. Come on, man. And so um, it's just so silly, man. It's just so silly. Um, and yeah, I thought about that story and I was like, oh, man, I should, I should share that. And then there was this one time also. And listen, we can't, you can't condemn a church or a denomination because of one person, right? Diverted by the beauty of the forest because of the ugliness of some of its trees. If this woman being a Christian said that to me, and I was like, see, all fucking Christians, this is where blah, 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 blah. I'm the asshole. I, I can't pigeonhole Christianity because of one woman's spiritual IQ. Come on, man. Or people that put blame on you um, if you're going through something, right? If you're going through a growth period and, you know, you're depressed or anxious or whatever, and they say, oh, well, you must not being, uh, you must not be, uh, you're not being honest about something. You know, you must be holding something from God. God must have been telling you to do something that you're not willing to do. Get the fuck out of here. Take that negative, judgmental shit down the street. I mean, what is that but shame and guilt? How you're feeling is wrong. You shouldn't be this way. And what they're saying there is if you had the relationship with God that I have, you would not be feeling like that. You would feel blissful and free all the time. Nah. Nah, sorry. And it it takes pain and and ha it takes a relationship with God, with the function of the universe to start to have conviction in how you believe and what you're open to and the, and what you're what you're closed minded to and the things you're unsure about and be completely OK with that. Most people want to have an answer for every aspect of God. 
this is the danger of reading spiritual texts, digesting all the YouTube videos of pastors and all they say, da, 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 and giving, getting their opinion and their perspective on, you know, certain scripture verses or, or whatever. And we go, answer, 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 while you're in your living room watching a video of it. And I'm speaking from experience, by the way. So what we can do is if some if a, a pastor or whatever reads a verse and then gives you a perspective on it and you understand it, what I would do, and I did this in recovery too with, with uh, uh, recovery literature, recovery text, all this stuff, with multiple books, and just because I understood it, my, my ego would be like, oh, like we have experience with that. And I'm like, no, we don't. You just read something and you're parroting it in a pretty way. And where spiritual pride kicks in, you'll be in a conversation with someone or let's say they're struggling with something and then you think about that perception that you were given from the pastor or the YouTube video, whatever, and then you go, oh, and you take that and you go blah, 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 blah to them and you parrot what you heard as though you've had experience with it. <clears throat> Only to give me this false feeling or false sense of superiority or spiritual pride. I'm not sure that there's much worse or uh, much of a um, corroding shortcoming or defect than uh, spiritual pride. And, you know, I think that we, I think that we all go through it. I definitely, definitely have gone through it. I'm sure that there is still levels of it within me. I, I hope not. I, I truly, you know, try to, to stay away from that if it ever seems to like rear its head. I, I, I never uh, speak it to other people or anything like that, but I think, you know, the, the human mind will judge and um, maybe I'll get caught up and I'll, I'll have to like dial back. Um, but it's like having faith in the process, having faith, like, like, let God be God. Let the uni be the uni, man, because life is really, really good at taking care of us. The only thing we need to have is an open mind, you know? I mean... It's like sometimes people respond like in the circumstance of the woman saying, oh, um, well, you should really reconsider because God told me this is supposed to happen, right? What would, what would God say in that moment? Would he throw judge and uh, would he judge and throw shame and guilt? I don't know, but not my God, you know? So anyways, I don't even know why the hell I started talking about that. But um, so some a couple of people sent in some uh, topics. <clears throat> My cousin Kaylee said, uh, accepting your true self, accepting your true self. OK, accepting your true self. And this is going to this is going to support what Sandra brought up, which is the benefits of doing shadow work on an individual and the collective consciousness. All right, so for me, this is gonna tie into like performance-based love. Okay, so, so for me, accepting my true self was accepting how flawed, broken, and full of shit I was, okay? Everything changed when I looked in the mirror and I said, you're the most full of shit person in every room. That matter of fact, you're so full of shit that it stinks when you talk, right? Because I was the parrot. 
I was the parrot. And then I was getting a parrot's demonstration, which was I was in a cage of my own making, right? Without realizing it, without realizing it. I was just digesting and then vomiting things that I heard. And this is where the ego wanted to keep me in this space of just digest and vomit up, digest and vomit up. And that's all surface level shit. And I experienced a lot of pain when I walked around and had these like pretty pictures of how I thought it was supposed to be and then talked about how I thought it was supposed to be when I had zero fucking experience with it. Um, so everything changed once I realized how full of shit I was. And when I realized that, it quieted me. It quieted me and it helped me to listen. It helped me to listen to my brothers and sisters who were attempting to live the same way that I was trying to live, which was become a man of purpose and passion and goodness and kindness and sobriety, right? Just to be a, a person that would never continually hurt themselves knowing that they're, knowing that they're gonna do that, right? I'll give an example. In my belief, the first thing to accept to get to your true self are your character defects and how they dominate your life and create your own misery. Now, I'm never going to get there unless I take full respons responsibility for everything in my life. Everything. The, the thing that you just thought about and you said, I can't take response, that fucking too, that too, right? I understand, right? It's like, raise your hand if you've been through a lot of unjust situations that you had no part in creating. Most people have. I'm not saying take responsibility as that's on you, that's your fault. But if you would like to rise above the pain that is gnawing deep in your skull from that unjust experience, then you have to take responsibility for the healing of that. Because that event, whatever has happened, it's already gone. It's bye-bye. It's scales of the past, right? It, it, we must shed it. We must shed it. It must go, it must go behind us, right? But if that is still deep within you and it's gnawing at your skull, now it's on you. Now it's on you to seek help. Most people do not want to take full responsibility for their life. There's always a couple fingers pointing out. If he did this, if only he would understand, if she would just respect me, the kids won't listen to me, no one does this, um, if she would just understand where I'm coming from, ba, 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 right? It's all because of him, it's all because of her. This job, I can't stand this job, they don't pay me enough, all this stuff. Joseph Campbell says, your life is 100% your own doing. Stop complaining. One of the most gangster quotes I've ever heard. Your life, the fruit of your life is 100% your own making. Stop complaining. Who wants that responsibility? Not me. Not me. Now, the benefit of going through tragedy, like um, for me, it was addiction. We see it with... Um, uh, terminal illnesses like cancer or divorce or the kids get taken away or you get fired from the job, you go broke, right? Things collapse and they just collapse and you're woken up. When things collapse, it has the ability to hit you in between the eyes and the veil comes up a little bit and you kind of say, well, you look around and you go, my life is the way it is right now because I designed it that way. I gave up. I was too busy blaming. I was trying to shed responsibility from, my, from myself. And so pain has a very good way 
at cracking the ego open, cracking those defects open to see that the only person that has the ability to change your life is the one looking at you in the mirror. Accepting that responsibility is terrifying, but it's also incredibly exciting. With great power comes great responsibility. If you want to step into this power of recreating your life, you're going to have to be really responsible, accountable, and dependable. And you're not going to know where the hell you're going. Because that is the call to adventure, as Joseph Campbell would say. The call doesn't always come in a pretty way. It's not just like a nice phone call. Hey, we would like you to go on this type of adventure and be this new man or be this good woman. No, it usually comes through pain, destruction, your house getting burnt down, uh, your parents dying. These are all in, you know, Batman was an orphan. Uh, Spider-Man was, was an absolute dork, right? And then his uncle died. It broke him down. Then he got bit by a spider. All these, all these stories of the hero's journey start with some type of collapse of the norm collapse of the norm and what needs to collapse is my ego of being content with the normalcy of how i'm living my life destiny summons the hero however destiny wants to summon you and usually it's in a way that we're not a fan of right um Luke Skywalker, right? His, his house gets burnt down. Um, as I said, uh, um, uh, Batman, his parents were killed. Spider-Man, his uncle was killed. Um, you know, uh, uh, Simba, right? His, his father was killed, right? And he needed to become this king, right? He needed to accept responsibility that he was his father's son, that was terrifying for him, right? Um, Aladdin got trapped in the cave. It collapsed in on him, right? And then he was given this responsibility of having power, the genie. It's everywhere. And if you think these myths or these stories aren't happening within you and for you all the time, I feel bad for you. In my experience, it has been happening all the time, all the while, and still to this day. And so when destiny, God, universe, disrupts your norm and flips it upside down on its head, you're going on an adventure if you accept the call. And it's only an adventure because you don't know where you're going. And it ain't an adventure if you know where you're going. So what our spirit really wants is to go to the unknown. It wants to leap across the chasm. It wants to go into the abyss. It wants to go into the forest where there's no path. What doesn't want to do all that, which we talked about last episode, is the ego. Because it's like, hey, I got, I got some type of narration over here in your life and the norm Let's just stay here in pain and how it's everyone else's fault, not your responsibility, and you're never going to get through this because this was unjust. That's what it wants. It doesn't want to recognize that my hands have a part in all of this. It doesn't want that responsibility because there is a life of discipline that comes with that. And if you're anything like me, I rebel against discipline at in any form, in any form, when really it's what I always wanted. Okay, so that is the, that's the lead-in to accepting my true self. Once that ego gets cracked and destiny disrupts my norm, if I don't take responsibility for my life, I will never get down to my true self. Because the way I look at it is like this. We go through years of um, life or pain or injustice or whatever. 
And we talked a little bit about this last episode too, but we go through all these life experiences and it has a way to uh, has a way of calcifying us and making us hard and cold and aloof. We don't have to learn how to be a good person or to be our authentic true self. We just have to chip away at the scales of pride and prejudice that have been blocking me off from my own authenticity what I've learned is that there is a man within me that wants to come out and play, that I have been oppressing him, covering him up, throwing rubble on top of him, uh, character defects, ego, all this shit, all these characters, all this fear, whatever. In doing all that, I've blotted out or muffled the voice of my true self. So the only thing I have to do is if I truly believe that in the center of my being, there is authenticity, there is the kingdom of heaven, there is bliss consciousness, there is purity and joy and laughter and hope and compassion and excitement and spontaneity. If I believe that, then my life's work will be in dying to everything that is not that. That is not a comfortable experience. So like when somebody asks, oh, how do I accept my true self? The answer is going to be, from, from my mouth, the answer is going to be what you don't want it to be, which is look at where you're fucking up. Look at your selfishness, your resentment and anger, your self-pity, um, your, your prejudices, your discontentment, your irritability, the role you play, um, your victimization. That's where I started because that was the stuff that had calcified over me, unbeknownst to me, by the way. And that's why recovery is such a beautiful thing, or specifically the 12 steps, is because, you know, people come in, oh, I want to get better, I want to get better. And we go, okay, yeah, you do? Yeah, I'm, sure I'm willing to do anything. And what the 12 steps do is they go, okay, let's see what you got. And they point back at you. And then people go, I, I, mean, I want to be sober, but like, you know, if I can settle with shooting heroin like a gentleman, I'll take that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that ain't a thing, dude. That ain't a thing. You can try it, though. Um, and so it's like this. Everyone wants to be a lion until it's time to hunt. Everyone wants to be sober until it's time to live as sober people live. Everyone wants to experience authenticity of their true self until they figure out it's accepting responsibility for their whole life, they reconsider. That's what I never wanted to do. And I hid behind my life getting better being God's responsibility. It's not. I can tap into his power but he, never once has he promised to sweep down from the heavens and clean things up for me. It's almost like God was waiting for me to take responsibility for my life, for every part of my being, my mind, my body, and my spirit. The answer is always going to be where you don't want it to be. There's always going to be so much treasure in the place you don't want to go the most. There are going to be things. There's going to be low-level pain at the base of your skull for as long as you let it be there. What pain... 
does for me is it wants me to look at it. That's what pain is to me. It wants to be looked at because we think that, oh, I don't want to look at this pain. It's going to be uncomfortable. When you look at and you honor pain, you're giving it permission to release itself through the same consciousness in which it was stored. So rather than it sitting at the base of the skull and just slowly, slowly gnawing away at you, just always there. I mean, the sad thing is that people live 20, they're 10, 20, 30, 40 years without ever addressing the pain. That's the sad, that's the sad thing. You know, there, uh, in one of my favorite movies, Peaceful Warrior, he says, um, most people live a whole lifetime without ever being awake. And that's the sad thing. And so when I honored the fact that I did not know how to tap into my authenticity, that's when I was shown all my character defects and shortcomings. And it was the way that I was thinking about things, my limiting beliefs, my performance based love for God. I thought that I had to do the whole like, you know, the monkey with the tambourines that just, you know, walks around hits the tambourines. That's what I thought I had to do. I thought I had to be a good, good spiritual man. And if I was a good spiritual man, and I wore the spiritual recovery cape, and I flew around and everyone knew I was, then I was going to be all right. And I was going to receive gifts from God. The definition of grace is undeserved favor. So if I need to perform for God, then what is grace? It's undeserved favor. The physician came for those that are sick, not those that are healed. Christ sat with the dirtiest, murderous, prostitutes, selfishness, gambling, resentful, angry sons of bitches you could ever find. And he dined with them, and he washed their feet, and he healed them, and he taught them, and he guided them through action. So why am I expecting myself to be spiritually perfect? God didn't come for perfection. <laughs> God is perfection. He came for the imperfect to show us how to do it, right? And so I started to, like, here's a silly, here's, a, here's an example, right? All right, so I would go to bed. Every, this was, like, in my, like, first year of recovery. I started to, like, see how, um, I started to see, like, these limiting beliefs. And firstly, like, within that first year, I started to get honest and uh, boast about how scared I was, how intimidated I was, how much self-doubt I had. I started to tell people about that. I started to get honest with men. I started to communicate these feelings. And when I did, what was met with me was reciprocity, was the three powerful words. And they would say, yeah, me too. And so when I did that, I would be joined together in the power of God through absolute vulnerability, where two or more are gathered in my name, in their midst I will be. Well, what is God's name? Let's think about some characteristics. Vulnerability, he came into the world and left the world in absolute vulnerability. So therefore, if I step into um, vulnerability and I practice that, then I'm by definition living in the breath and the will of God. That's how I see it. So in accepting my flaws and accepting all my death by a thousand cuts, I'm stepping into the arena in which I can get healed. I'm not trying to posture or puff out my chest or put on a pretty face and pretend that I'm okay. Because the reality is I'm not okay. 
And if I don't have the vulnerability to step out into the world or my loved ones or seek help or go to therapy or 12 step pro or whatever you need to receive help, if I don't have the courage to unravel myself and open myself up for love, I really shouldn't expect to receive anything back because we have a part to play. We have a part. There's a relationship I'm entering into if I want to land in my authentic self. This is, and this is my belief, you know, like I could be completely wrong. So I remember I was living in my apartment in Pompano and I would go to bed every night and I would say, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. All right, I'm going to leap out of bed at 5 a.m. I'm going to pray for probably 20 minutes on my knees. Then I'm going to float to my chair, meditate for like 40 minutes. And then I'm going to fucking float to the kitchen, make a perfect, glorious farm to table meal drink mineral water, pet my cat shadow, and then I'm going to read some spiritual text. I'm going to do some two-way prayer. I'm going to journal. And I would go to bed literally every night with this spiritual perfect idea of the man that I expected myself to be at 5 a.m. Now, I can't remember the last time I got up at 5 a.m., you know, maybe to go to the airport, you know. Every night, I would place this unreasonable curriculum on my head, and I would just throw boulders of it on my shoulders, right? And then I would, the alarm would go off at 5 a.m. Without missing a beat, I'd hit snooze. Bing. And then I hit snooze about 13 more times until I was had 20 minutes before I had to get up and go to work. I would roll out of bed, say a quick prayer, wash myself up, brush my teeth, throw on some clothes and run out the door. And I hated myself before I even breached my door. Now, nobody did that to me but me. God didn't do that. I did that. I had this performance-based love, right? So what I was setting myself up for was a morning performance. And if I performed just right, that meant that I was a good spiritual man and God loves me and it was going to be a good day. Now, if I didn't wake up at 5 a.m., hit snooze 17 times and ran out my door. I was a bad spiritual man. God wasn't going to talk to me. And oh, good luck staying sober, asshole. Just ba 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 all up in the mind, in the mind, in the mind. Judgment, shame, guilt, remorse, right? And what I like to call it was uh, I had a report card guy that was in the clouds being like, oh, you... Uh, Hit snooze 17 times this morning, huh? And only said a little quick prayer. Well, good luck staying sober, asshole. You get an effort today. And it's like, who the hell wants that God? Apparently my mind did, right? So this is what changed. I had to accept the fact that I was not a 5 a.m. guy. I've never been to the part of the 5 a.m. club. And maybe I never will, right? I had to accept the fact that I don't work out in the mornings, that my body doesn't warm up till fucking 3 p.m., right? That I'm not going to wake up and make myself breakfast. I'm not going to wake up and have two hours before I go to work because that's never been me up until that point. So if all the data I have suggests me not being that guy and I go to bed every night with the expectation of me being that guy, I'm the, I'm the asshole, dude. Nobody was doing that to me but me. So I had to accept the fact 
that I was not a 5 a.m. guy. And so this was the change. This is how I accepted my true self. And my true self at that moment was, I'm not going to get up at 5 a.m., pray for 20 minutes, meditate for 49 minutes, and make food. Not going to happen. So what would happen if I set my alarm for, let's say, 30 minutes before I had to get up? What would happen? I don't know. Let's give it a shot. I slept better, and I stopped having a relationship with the snooze button, okay? And next thing you know, I didn't wake up with something to perform. I woke up as a guy who now made a decision to not be a morning person. Perfect. I had to accept that that was my true self at that moment right? And the freedom that comes with that is amazing. Because what am I freeing myself of? Shame, guilt, remorse, judgment, morbid reflection, sadness, anxiety. I literally threw all that shit off my shoulders by accepting the fact that I don't get up early. (laughs) <laughs> and that I work out at night. Man, that shit was so freeing, man. Because nobody was doing that to me but me. And God's like, hello, you don't have to wake up two hours before you go to work for me to love you and support you. You don't have to pray for a set amount of minutes for me to love you and support you. You don't have to meditate for me to love you and support you. You don't have to eat right for me to love you and support you. You're making yourself have to do that to love and support yourself. And there's no authenticity in that. It's all a performance that I always fail at. Damn. So I had it wrong. Nobody was doing that to me but me. And then I would do it to myself at night too, right? I would about to be, I would about uh, be off of work and I would say, man, I'm going to go home. I'm going to have a very healthy dinner and I'm going to do some writing about the day. I'm going to do some self-reflection and some inventory. I'm going to go into my room. I'm probably, I'm going to pray and meditate. Now, I knew that the only thing I wanted to do was go home, watch The Office for the 70th time, and smash Ben and Jerry's by myself. That's all I wanted to do. And I knew that that was what I was going to do. So in that moment, I have two choices, all right? Go home, watch The Office and eat Ben and Jerry's and hate myself the whole time while I'm doing it or accept the fact that that was my true self at that time and claim and accept God's love and support while I watch The Office and eat Ben and Jerry's. Because the reality of my life was I'm going to smash some Ben and Jerry's and I'm going to watch The Office to dial down. That was my reality. In accepting that moment of of who I was in that moment, even though it may have not been my ideal self, what happened was I threw off all this shame, guilt, and judgment that that shit was robbing me of the energy to be anything different. So once I accepted uh, 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 these perceived flaws of the guy who watches the office and eats ice cream and doesn't get up two hours before he goes to work. Once I accepted that that's who I was, a brand new type of energy was born, right? And all of a sudden I started to get up earlier and earlier and 10 minute increments and 10 minute. And all of a sudden I was like getting bored of the office and I decided to like read a book naturally. I fell into it naturally. So in getting what I wanted, 
Let me say it this way. To get what I wanted, to become the man that I wanted to be, I had to let go of it. Welcome to the fucking paradox of spirituality. It's in everything, right? Step into the paradox. And we go, well, how, how could I just let that go? I really want it. Because you're trying to wrestle it into your life. And if I try to wrestle and bend and crack things into my life to make them fit how I think that they should fit, I'm never going to be able to hold it there for long enough. It's always going to snap back on me. Once I accepted the fact that that wasn't me at that moment, it relieved me of this, gosh, this shame and guilt and this report card God that I had. And all of a sudden, I started to experience God differently. And with that came freedom. And all that shame and that guilt, it stopped robbing me. It stopped robbing me, robbing me, robbing me. And then all of a sudden, I start to work backwards. And I fall into the person that I always wanted to be. But it came as a result of letting go, of turning that person over, of accepting who I was in that moment. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. And this really, so that's like, that's the shadow work, right? Accepting who and what I really am, followed by a sincere attempt to become all that I'd want to be. Accepting who and what I really am, followed by a sincere attempt to become everything that I'd want to be. Beautiful. What a way to live. And this has been the case over and over. So now, fast forward some years, and this just naturally came to me. I've been practicing Vedic meditation for the last four years. I meditate 20 to 30 minutes every morning. I meditate 20 to 30 minutes every night. Um, I'm up at a minimum between two hours before I go to work. I love my morning quiet times. I read all the time. I Right? It's like, but it, it's effortless. I don't have a regimen. Yeah, I miss some meditations here and there, but I don't crucify myself for it. It came to me when it was supposed to. I reach out to this guy, Matt Cardone, this meditation teacher. I heard him on another podcast. I have him come on. We chop it up. I go... I think I'm kind of picking up what this guy's putting down. Let me see if it works. I didn't even think that I was going to be able to continue to meditate and have that spiritual practice because I had never been that guy. But I stepped into the unknown. And the unknown was accepting who and what I really was at that moment, which was a guy that had no routine, ate Ben and Jerry's, watched The Office, and got up late every day. That's who I was. So I was the asshole for not accepting the fact that that was my reality. And it's just a, a, like, it's just a beautiful thing. Nobody owes you anything. This world doesn't owe you anything. You owe it to yourself to let go. You owe it to yourself to accept who and what you really are. That's the person we want to give to the world. Man, everything I ever wanted is on the other side of letting go. Um, somebody said this to me. What'd she say? Damn, I'm going to forget it. Oh, I wrote it down. If you understand it and you feel it, there is no need to try and explain it. Don't try to explain yourself well or write out a curriculum for yourself well. If you feel something on the inside of you and you know there's some shit you got to accept and you got to take responsibility for, do it. See what comes of it. Don't push it away. Feel it. Follow it. If you find yourself falling, dive. It was the resistance to me being that person that I was that was keeping me that person. Like this resistance, this fight, this hard pressed and bend and twist and 
all that has energy. It has vibration to it. And because of that resistance, it fucking, it broke me. It just kept me right there. Once I let go and said, this is who I am, it lost its power. Things are going to come to you when they're supposed to come to you on its own time. One line I always land on that I love, and we're going to end here, when the time is right and you are right, providence will provide. Again, when I, when I dial into that and I say, okay, I'm going to believe that. I'm going to have that faith in life. I'm going to have that faith in God and the universe. There's not much left for me to play with after that. Because what I'm saying is all my responsibility is to make sure that I'm right, that I'm right on the inside. And I'm moving around with love accountability, dependability, responsibility, and that I'm just a, trying to be a good person. And that if I stay in that vibration, if I stay in that energetic state, that life is going to give me the right people, the right relationships, the right sum of money, the right job, the right connections, the right car, the right state, everything. And the ego says, uh, we don't like that. We want something to play with. We want a curriculum, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, I don't know, do you? When the time is right and you are right, providence will provide. Thank you, everyone, for listening, your love and support. Um, people have been asking me how can they support and get involved. The best thing you could do, man, share You know, whatever your favorite episode is you're listening Send one of your favorite episodes to your friend. That's it. Send one of your favorite episodes to your friend. That's it, man. And we just, we appreciate all the listening, all the love, all the comments, all the shares, and it, it means the world. Uh, peace. I hope you're having a killer new year. What's the eternal principle? Dark one. <laughs> Which is? Well, we call it God, but that personifies it.